Hello, everyone. Welcome to Women Seeking Wholeness, episode 154. This is about being a mindful mama. Now, this is not to say that mindful daddies can listen to this too. And no matter what age your kids are, I think this is a really great episode for kind of coming back into what parenting is really all about. Hunter Clark Fields is a mindful mama mentor. She's the creator of the Mindful Parenting Course, host of the Mindful Mama podcast, and she's a widely followed author of her best-selling book, Raising Good Humans, a mindful guide to breaking the cycle of reactive parenting and raising kind, confident kids. So in our episode, we go into, you know, the struggle, the real struggle, (laughs) the struggle is real about really being truly present with your kids and what that actually means. And we have this great sort of dialogue on what it means to have a beginner's mind with your kids and staying curious why some of the things that we do with our children have them not listening to us because they're more about tuning into our frequency rather than our words. And I just opened the waiting list again for Stan Speak Shine course. So if you haven't uh, put yourself on the waiting list for that, you're definitely going to want to. I talk about all things mindfulness and feminine power and coming into your soul path and uh, really finding your voice and really standing, speaking and shining. So look for that on shereeburton.com or standspeakshine.com. And continue to follow us on social media, Instagram, Cherie.Burton, as well as asking to join our private Facebook group, Women Seeking Wholeness. So without further delay, let's bring in Hunter Clark Fields of the Mindful Mama podcast and author of Raising Good Humans. Hunter, welcome to Women Seeking Wholeness. So fun to have you on. Thank you. I'm so pleased to be here. It's really a pleasure. I've been looking forward to talking to you because I need this. (laughs) Uh, I was telling you in our pre-conversation that, you know, kids of all ages and I have this 12 year gap between, you know, the college kids and now, you know, the younger kids. And I'm finding that um, I was much more patient with the young, with my kids who are now older when I was, cause I was a younger mom mm. and now I'm 50, I just turned 53 and I have a seven and a nine year old. And I'm like, okay, I thought I was supposed to be progressing in life. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I mean, here I am teaching all this mindfulness stuff and like, I'm a coach and I run these programs and I'm all into spirituality and stuff. And it's like, what this is like my night this 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 um outlet is like a vice Mm. to just go unconscious for whatever reason and it's it doesn't happen all the time but when it does happen i'm like where did that come from so i want to start with sort of that cycle of reactivity that you teach about your book is called raising good humans a mindful guide to breaking the cycle of reactive parenting and raising kind, confident kids. I have to say my first set, I was very conscious. That's why I need your help. The first set of kids, I was really conscious and I can see the fruits of that now. They're, they're very conscious themselves, but. Well, you're not alone. You know, I mean, like in, in mindful parenting, which is the program I run, they, that we have a, a number of older parents and moms. And, and it's funny because you get to this point in your life where you're like, I'm good at doing things. I like doing the things in life. Like I've gotten the, I've done the grades, the job, the relationship. I'm good with the relationships in my life. And then you get to like kids and you're like, what? Why is this so insane? What's wrong with me? So true. (laughs) I mean, kids are like by nature, you know, by definition, immature, right? Like their, their behaviors are like annoying. They're frustrating. They're messy. They don't know how to do stuff. They don't know how to communicate You're And it's just like, you're like, it's your home that you're living with these human beings with. And you're like, I just want to be able to relax and enjoy my home. It's very, well, yeah. And especially someone at my age, because most of the, the friends I have that are my age, and my mom herself, when she was my age, was like a grandma and all the kids were out of the house. And, 
um, I'm a grandma too. My oldest daughter has two little boys and one on the way and they're adorable and I love it, but it's like, I'm just going to play a martyr for a second. Okay. (laughs) Um, most of the women my age are not raising young children and the resistance that I meet with myself and my husband, I talk about this all the time and bless his heart. He, he is, he's in the struggle with me, but he's a, he's a, a very, um, engaged, he's engaged in this with me, I should say, as a, as a full partner, we're both, we both work from home. You know, if I have projects and things I need to do, he says, go. So we're in the thick of this all over again with two completely different, fiery, passionate, crazy personality children, Eli and Emma. And so the resistance I meet, I think is fueling that reactivity. I feel because I'm, I, I want to be a writer. I want contemplation. I want peace, you know, and that's just not what the universe has served up. No, no, I guess not. Yeah. So you're, yeah, it's a, it's hard if you're not, you know, part of you, part of you is not accepting the, the full, the reality yeah. of the situation, you know, then it's even, it's even harder to do the things we need to do to, to be present, which include, of course, accepting our feelings, you know, like with kids, we have to, you know, they, they demand attention, right? Like that's what they want to be seen and they want to be heard. Like we, that we know that, right. They want to be seen and to be heard. And we know that we need to and meet so those do we. kids and like, we, we, but we need that, that too. Right. Yeah. Like, and, and they're, they're, you know, we both, we both have these needs. We need to be meet both of our needs, but kids are often, you know, it's like, like there's a lot of uh demandingness there you know because that that need to be seen and heard is so so big when you're little and and you don't have the skills to delay your gratification in the same way that you do as an adult right and and even like in in hearing you say that like they can't articulate hey i just want to be seen and heard any more than we can we don't do that we don't say to our husband or our partner spouse or whatever we don't say I really need you to see me and hear me. Right. Like we don't advocate for that. And maybe that's why we get triggered. I don't know. There's so many layers to this, right? Yeah. Yes, indeed. Definitely. I mean, so you, but you have a lot for you, you have so much going for you and that you have a lot of self-awareness, you know, you have practice and mindfulness, you practice in introspection, you probably have awareness of like when your stress levels are getting out of control, right? Because we know that when, you know, we were, when we're, we're losing it with the kids, when we're not able to be present with the kids, we know that one of the baseline things that is the most important for that is just overall stress levels. Cause no one like wakes up in the morning and says, I think I'm going to just lose it at, at Eli at gonna, like yeah. 3 PM today, you know, because <laughs> he's going to do no, you, no one does that. No one chooses that. You're not, you're not choosing to flip your lid. It's just, it, it happens because you have a, you're wired for survival and your biology is saying this is threatening right now and you have stress. And so if you have too much stress in your life, one of the biggest ways to reduce or yelling and reactivity is to just kind of reduce our overall stress in general. Right. So, right. so and that's, that's, that's pretty life. much the culprit of everything. It's, it's, we're all walking around and say, I'm making a very general blanket statement, but most humans in any given window of time are battling the stress response. Like it's just become so um, programmed or patterned, I guess, that we don't even know that we're yeah. in inflammation, that we don't, we, that we've activated that because it's so second nature. Oh yeah. Yeah. We're, we're like living with a baseline level of it because of our society and our expectations to, you know, for ourselves to just do so much, the, the lack of sleep we get, the, um, Mm -hmm. you know, all of these things, the distractions that are constantly like they erode our ability to be steady, have a steady heart and mind and nervous system. So there's a lot of things there that are just really eroding that ability to, um, be aware of what, what's happening for ourselves. You know, we're living our lives through little, little boxes (laughs) in front of us. And so the idea of of being in our bodies and noticing that 
tightness in the chest and, and be, you know, tuning into that nonetheless, like that feels, um, feels counterintuitive. And yet it's this, it's the thing we need to do when we're in those moments and the, it's the practice of tuning into those things that, you know, are not, uh, distracting. They're not entertaining. <laughs> They're not yeah. even comfortable, right? Like we have to tune into these sensations in our body to that don't feel comfortable. And as we practice so the, the basis of like mindful parenting is, is mindfulness and, and tuning into that. And the, and what I think, why I think, you know, research shows that mindfulness does all these wonderful things which you probably already talked about in your podcast. But one of the things it talks about is the ability to, um, to be less reactive impulse control. And mm. I think the, the researchers aren't quite sure how that works, but I think the way that works is that when you sit and you sit in your meditation practice and your mindfulness practice, you sit and all this stuff comes up, like the to-do list, the, the, the thought about this, the feeling of anxiety, all this stuff comes up and you just practice staying with it. You to practice not reacting. And so you're building a muscle literally mm -hmm. of less reactivity and, and, and we need that, right? It's because everyone says, I remember when I was, um, when my daughter, my oldest daughter was one and a half and two, and I had all this anger coming up in me. I like, I had this temper where it was arising. It was like, I felt horrible about it. It was like, this is exactly what I didn't want to do. Right. This was exactly the worst thing for me. <laughs> and, um, I remember listening to coaches about parenting and they would say, just pause and respond this way. Just pause and respond this way. And I'd be like, but how, how do you do that? Right. When how you, do you do when that? And that's, that's the that, key to be able to practice that impulse control. Yeah. And what you're bringing up makes me think about, you know, cause I've heard all the stuff too about, you know, the power of the pause and all of that. But what's happening when you're in a trauma or a stress response is your your higher functioning brain, your forebrain is not literally it's turned off. It's not working. Yes. So when we say it's like a paradox, it's like be mindful and all your chemicals are firing. You know, yeah. every every unconscious pattern now is activated. Go ahead and be mindful. And <laughs> Yeah. So it's bananas, it doesn't you make any yeah, kind of and, sense. And I want to, I want to <laughs> dive into that because as women, we, and you brought it up, we experience so much guilt as mothers that we can't quote unquote control this, that mm -hmm. this tempestuousness, this fiery, the anger. Um, I will say that my youngest daughter, Emma really triggers me a lot. She's seven and she's adorable, but, but, and I love her. And she is a little warrior. She um, yells a lot and stomps and throw. It's like having a teenager. And she's been this way since she was like two or three. And it's like, oh, one of the things that triggers in me is why does she get to do that? And I don't like, I have that awareness. <laughs> I want to do that. Why does she get to do that? Yeah. Why can't I do that? <laughs> like my, my little girl self couldn't do that. Like mm -hmm. my parents would not have tolerated that. You had to suppress it. Right. And my adult self sometimes wants to throw these tantrums and yell and, and it's not apropos. So I figured that is, out. Yeah, no, that's an incredible insight. That's an incredible insight because a lot of it, we have all these different parts of us and part of us wants to be like, you know, part of, you know, you just want to fall on the floor and cry and crawl into bed or you want to yell and all of those things. And, and, and yeah, and it's that impulse control, right? That, that separates us. We're the ones with the fully developed brain. We're the ones whose behavior yeah. and modeling, right? So we have to be the ones to, you know, put on our big girl panties and do those things. It doesn't mean that we're not going to accept that we have anger. We have frustration. Well, I do think it's all important. those things, right? We weren't able to express anger. Yeah, we weren't. And I think it's incredible that <laughs> we now know that that was not healthy. And so here I am trying to navigate those waters with Emma. And I'm like, I want her to know that anger is healthy, but I don't know that I model 
healthy anger expression all of the time because of those things you said in the back of my mind, because women, we do this, we multitask. So in the back of my mind, I'm like, to thinking of all the things I need to do, whether it's around the house or with my business or whatever, I'm thinking of these things I have to do. And then here comes an angry Emma. So I have to literally like shut, uh, shut down the, the task orientation that I'm feeling and the overwhelm I'm already feeling by the things that are undone or that demand my attention. So when she comes screaming, it's like, I shut down. I, 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 I don't come to a place where I want, how about this? I don't want to be mindful. Hmm. So even climbing under this reactivity cycle, it's like, <laughs> this is classic psychology. Like you have to want, like, how does a psychologist change the light bulb? Well, you have to want to change the light bulb. <laughs> and, um, it's, it's that it's that it's like, well, I'd like to throw a fit right now too. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's an energy output. It's really interesting because, you know, our whole brain, I had, um, uh, neuroscientists come on the, uh, the mindful mama podcast and talk about the brain and how the brain is all about conserving energy, right. And predicting what's going to happen in the future, et cetera. And it takes so much energy for us to be able to, <clears throat> to maybe respond in that optimal way, we might decide to respond if we're in a really well-rested, relaxed yeah. kind of place. And the, the energy also takes to switch from what you were doing <clears throat> to where you are is an enormous output of energy too. And you're right, it does take a real desire to want to do that. And it does take some, some practice. But I would also offer that it's okay, you know, to give yourself maybe like that outlet right? For, for that experience of like, this sucks. I don't want to be here with the screaming kid. <laughs> I'm miserable. Right. The human part and so of that. Yeah. You, you, we can do that skillfully, you know? So my, uh, my, when my, one of my daughters was nine, we had a movie night one night and after movie night, she got like manic instead of tired. And I was exhausted. I was just like, oh God, just make her go away. <laughs> I'm just going to read my book and pretend I don't do experience this. And then she laughed at me and I was like, like yeah, crazy oh, raging volcano like... of trigger. Right. <laughs> and be and serious. Then, <laughs> but like in that moment, at that point I had practiced enough. And in that moment I was so angry, but I, was able to yell skillfully. And I'm, for that, I'm really proud of that moment, which is I, I got up and I yelled, I'm really angry right now. <laughs> I slammed the door, walked out of the carport. I threw that poor book down onto the carport <laughs> driveway. And I walked up and down the street for 20 minutes to calm down. But it's possible for us to express those feelings without doing it in the way that maybe the unskillful way that our parents might have done it, which may have been like, what's wrong with you? Why don't you just go to bed? You're so annoying, right? Like yeah. we can say, I'm really, I can't, I'm not able to deal with this right now. I need a break mm -hmm. and we can walk away. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's awesome. I, that's and I, like and I great love that. modeling for yeah, our kids. That giving that permission is huge. Um, for me, it's, I don't want to kill her spirit. Cause I, like what you were saying, I have, she, my daughter's like that too. She's got so much energy in, with any activity or when anyone comes to the home, it's like, someone lights a fire and she's just this thing bouncing around. And, um, I'm like wanting her to adult that rather than honoring that. So this is what I mean. I don't, I don't want to kill her spirit. I don't want to squelch her fire. I, I want, I love that about her. And also when I say the universe served up these two, well, Eli is exactly the same as she is. They're both very fiery children. And, it's like multiple people have told me, well, they're your teachers. They are your spiritual practice. You know, when we talk about mindfulness, you said it takes this enormous energy to come back to a, a place of love. 
Cause that's for me, that's, that's the heart of mindfulness really is like, how can I be in right now and make the most loving and have loving awareness really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I'm not feeling it for myself in that moment, there's no way she's getting that from me. Yeah. Yeah, You can't fake it. (laughs) You know, they, they've got amazing BS meters. (laughs) She's going to see right through it. If you try to fake it. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. It's like that smile of benevolence with this energy behind it. If I want to kill you right now, you know, (laughs) which a lot of women put on that face. I know that. that. And our kids, it's so much better for our kids to just say, whoo, I am a little overwhelmed right now. I'm having trouble listening right now. I need a break. Right. It's much, much better to say that. Cause then our kids know when I'm feeling overwhelmed, I can do this thing. Cause I've seen it done. You know, that whole thing, our kids are crap at doing what we say, but great at doing what we do is so true. I heard, so true, I heard a teacher right? once say your children are watching the show, not listening to the lecture. Ooh, it's like they're I energetically like, like holding some popcorn and just wa- like eating the popcorn and just watching you do your thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it's so when you of, give yourself permission to be human, you give them permission to be human. Yeah. You give her her name. When you give yourself permission to express as skillfully and without harm as much as you can, yes. your nature, you give her permission and a, a pattern for expressing that in hers. Not I have to be perfect all the time. You don't want to give her that message, right? No. So you I, you have to give yourself permission to be human too. Yes. That's always a, isn't that always a work in progress? Um, (laughs) And I, I recognize that when I am the most impatient with her is when I am the most impatient with whatever I'm processing in my life with myself. Maybe there's a, um, maybe there's some kind of emotion I'm working through, or maybe I'm processing some old trauma or some stuck emotional debris. It just happens to be up. And she is the flame that triggers the like, Oh, here it is right in my face now, because my child just ignited it. Mm -hmm. I was able to keep it at bay a little bit, (laughs) you know, but here it is. And I don't have that awareness in the moment though. I have it later, which And here's maybe where we can go next is um, when we're talking about that humanness is that when I had the recognition of, of how she triggered that, I don't, I, I want to come back to her and say, you know what I said yesterday, or, you know, I was really angry yesterday. Well, that's not about you. It's not your fault. I had some, some mad and sad feelings in my heart and I took it out on you and that wasn't right. That takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of um, humility. And um, and it's an awesome thing to do. It's yeah, I how wish. Our kids learn what a real apology is. That's how they learn to begin anew. Yeah. Yeah. I, I need to do that more with my husband, too. That's it's funny. Your, <laughs> your, your partner and your kids, they really do hold a mirror up to you. Yeah. Really yeah. Do. And it's not always something we, we want to see, although we, t- we tend not to see it when it's something great. Right. We tend to like just gloss it over. But then when it's something that we don't want to see, then we're like, oh, no, look at that. Hone right in on it. Right. Yeah. And um, you're just showing and you just playing the part on my stage that I I've assigned for you because I'm projecting onto you what I haven't healed in myself. Um, I want to talk about your the timing of your book. I find it really interesting. You were telling me that, that you finished this book and got it out to the publisher and it came out literally the December before COVID. So December of 2019. Mm -hmm. And I was telling you, wow, that kind of gave me chills because the universe needed that out there. Probably too many people who not knowing what they would be facing by being quarantined together as families and, I mean, talk about such an, I mean, domestic violence went way up during the the initial uh, months of COVID and people were losing jobs and there was so much stress and there was so much uncertainty and fear and stuff like that. Um, And I had read that, you know, uh, when schools closed down, that a lot of children were going to either go hungry or be abused because 
they were, you know, school was kind of the buffer. And if they went back and they had to be at home and be on the computer to do their studies um, without a loving, you know, present parent, and that just broke my heart. Um, it, it's, it's interesting how COVID really has sort of, and not just with parenting, but with everything that's um, broken, it's sort of like shown a flashlight on it. Oh yeah. Exacerbated. I thought the isolation of families was a huge problem before COVID. Mm. Now, my God, the isolation and the lack of support that we have as families, it's just, it's crazy. You know, So what, what do you see? Let's kind of walk. You talk about something called the beginner's mind. And I know that's a mindfulness term and I love it. Um, I follow people like Eckhart Tolle and, um, Pima Chodron and people who t- talk about being here now. And there's a lot of Buddhist and esoteric teachings around this principle, but it's also everywhere in scripture. What is the beginner's mind, first of all, in the way that you define it in your work, and then walk us through how we can hold that for mm-hmm. ourselves, that state. Well, I, I think beginner's mind is a practice, right? It's like something we return to again and again as we remember. <laughs> and it's the idea, of course, of looking at everything as a beginner with fresh eyes. So I kind of like to imagine like, like, you know, imagine you've been beamed down into your family <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> you're, like an alien. <laughs> you're, you're an alien beamed down into your household and you can look at your kids and say, who are you right now? Like be, bring this curiosity. And that's the essential, that's mm. the essential thing. in a lot of ways about mindfulness is kind, the two essential attitudes of kind mindfulness are kindness and curiosity. Mm. And beginner's mind is about this curiosity. Can I be curious about, whoa, what's going on here? Who, what's, what's driving you to do this? Right. Can I, can I be curious about it rather than having, um, and it, it fights what our brain naturally does, right. To conserve energy, which is take the shortcuts and the labels and all the things, which is great because we don't have to decide each morning afresh to brush our teeth, but (laughs) <laughs> it isn't so great when we're just saying you're this and I'm not saying anything about you, but this, right? You're, you're this type of child. And I'm not saying anything about you, but this type of child. So if I didn't know you, if I were as looking at, we're talking to you fresh, if I were listening to you fresh, like who would you be and what would you be? Um, I remember when I, my daughter was like, a was two, uh, two years old. I went away for like, uh, a week and a half. And when I came back, her voice sounded so different to me. I finally heard her voice in the way that everyone said, Oh my God, her voice is so cute. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, we had this amazing reunion. It was just this beautiful ability to see her fresh, right? Like, Oh, look at you. I have, now I have this perspective and that's the whole thing is about, taking perspective. And, and that's what mindfulness helps us do. Like, can I, can I have this perspective on my own thoughts? Can I have this, can I look at my own feelings and not be, I like to think of, imagine if you're like in a waterfall, you're just like in the water, but if I can step out in front of the waterfall, can I see the thoughts? Can I see the feelings? Can I see, you know, can I take perspective on, you know, in, you know, on a relationship on, on where some of these things are coming from. And I think that's what beginner's mind is all about. Like it's that curiosity, that perspective, which is how kids naturally are. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I was working with a coach and, and I was talking to her about how play just is not, I'm not one of those people in the past, (laughs) like, I'm not going to put that, that, yeah, yeah, don't loves, label it. <laughs> <laughs> that that is just living for play and fun and you know spontaneity. I mean, I love adventure. I travel and I do all these things. But actually, I, I formed a belief very young that play is frivolous. Mm. So she's like, I want you to just go sit with Emma and get curious exactly what you're saying. It's like, oh, why did you choose this doll? Oh, why did you want that Barbie to wear that? Oh yeah. What do you tell me about that? 
And it helps, helps me not only it's therapy for me, let's be honest, (laughs) it's great for her, but it's for me. It's for me to have, and you know, you could call it the beginner's mind and the curiosity around, you know, I want to know how she ticks, but it's helping me know how I tick. Mm -hmm. And, and then just putting us in this on the same, like me getting eye level, me, me on the floor with her. And I literally have to force myself to do it. (laughs) Um, The times that I have done it have been really powerful. And uh, like feeding that relationship, you know, just, I think that the thing we get caught up in a lot of times with kids is that we treat kids so differently than we treat like every other human being in life. Yeah. And we get into this, like, I am the mother, I'm in this role and you are in this role and these roles trip us up. And it's really this relationship. And that's what, you know, that's pointing to, like you were having mindfulness of Emma moment, right? Yeah. Like you are using her as an object of curiosity of being present. Right. And that's what, as we know, like every relationship needs, right. You said it all comes back to love. And like, yeah, one of the things like when we are in love with someone, right? Like they take up all of our attention. And I kind of think of that, like love is attention. Like if we pay more attention to something, we naturally start to love it. Like if you've ever paid attention to like a, a, a plant that you were growing or like a little, yeah. a, a, a ladybug out in the world. If you give it, like, if you, if you give that ladybug, like 45 minutes of your time, you were going to be in love with that ladybug by that. Right. And in love and attention are just Inter, you know, completely intertwined. Right. And so to come back and say, Emma, I am giving you my attention. I'm giving you my loving awareness, my curiosity. I may be setting a timer for 10 minutes. So I know I have an end point and I'm not going crazy <laughs> when yeah. I do this. Is there an end to this? <laughs> <laughs> but, but to give that, <clears throat> we don't have to do it hundred percent of the time, like just sometimes, right. To, and it's just like every relationship is like a relationship with our spouse. That's why we want to go on our date nights. Right. And we have to do, we want to do the same thing with our kids. We want to put in those deposits in the relationship bank account so that then when you need to withdraw, you've got some good, some good cushion there. Yeah. And I, and it is really interesting because, because we are parenting the younger two very differently than the first set of kids in the sense that, Um, you know, we are seeing, okay. I I talked about this in in a previous episode, how I wanted to be such a conscious parent with the first set of kids. I literally wanted to be the perfect mom. So any kind of, I, I shielded them from a lot in terms of, you know, healthy conflict resolution and that kind of thing, healthy anger expression. We just, I didn't, I wasn't always allowing for the humanness piece of it. And for me to show that it was all, it was all like, well, how do you feel about that? And processing, like I was a psychologist, there was a lot of love and a lot of touch and a lot of affection, but I can see how I did a disservice to them by not being real and saying that, like, I really want to, that makes me mad. Like I'm mad right now. I'm owning that I'm mad it's, you know, I'm not projecting that mad onto you. I, I wish I would have done that more. Yeah. The model, like, the safety of those feelings, right. It's, it's right. okay for us to have those feelings, but for you, just to cut you some slack, like women, I mean, anger to show anger, like that's oh. so shamed in our culture. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I did like 10 years of artwork about ferocious <laughs> and a predator animal women because cool. I was working out this idea of this anger, right? Like, you know, mm. well, you know, we're not allowed to have it in a weird way. And it, it doesn't make any sense. It's an energy that's in our body. That's natural. And so, yeah. You know, to have any kind of aggression as a woman, to have any kind of anger, we just, there's like a real innate shaming of that. And, and that's, that's, it hurts, right? That, that. Yeah. And a lot of, and we could really wax Jungian here, but um, a lot of that is from the collective conscious that we're just all these women, we're all carrying this collective anger and we have no self safe way to express it. It's not socially, it's, it's, it goes against every social moray to see a, a screaming, angry woman, and she's labeled all these things, right? It's not considered strength. Um, I actually just finished an essay called Sacred Rage that I'm going to be on another podcast presenting because of this very thing. And 
what I love about these last two kids is that here I am, you know, cause you know, you go, you hit a certain point in life. He's losing your, well, you're younger than me, but sometime in your forties, you really have this reckoning with how you've diffused your own anger and how it's shown up as physical malaise or another, how it's maybe not helped you have healthy relationships and those kind of things. And so, um, I find myself now just going, I see an angry woman. I'm like, that's freaking awesome. As long as she's not hurting someone else, as long as not as what's not coming out of her mouth is literally damaging another human. Mm -hmm. If she can own her anger and be a fire and own the, and not project, you know, like the dragon that just blows it out and burns everything up. But if you can be the dragon that blows it out in, I am woman, hear me roar, go for it. Like that's how change happens. So let's not shame the anger piece. Like you're saying, um, it's all over in art. I, am, I love that you, that you made that a study because it's, it's art was on, one of the only ways it could be expressed in times yeah. past. Yeah. Yeah. All those great images of Judith and Halifernes and Judith chopping off Halifernes' head, right? It's like a classic image from a biblical, they had a bunch of those yeah. in the, you know, it, it's really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's something we need to own if we're going to have peace too. It's totally. like weird, right? Like there's an acceptance of, I need to accept that I've got to be like, I have this, like all this extreme, right? If I'm going to be able to let it go and have peace and be able to have rest and steadiness and ease to have steadiness and ease, we need to accept that yeah, sometimes we're gonna have anger and then it's going to stop and we're going to be able to have steadiness and ease again, you know, totally, totally. Yeah. Well, I, um, I would love for us to kind of round out with you sort of giving us an example of, of a potential reactivity cycle being triggered, let's just say, and then sure. maybe just a couple practical things that it's like, okay, well, Oh, I'm triggered. I'm about to go into my old laid down like railroad tracks patterns that are fused in iron that I need to like slowly <laughs> repattern, but I have this awareness that I'm triggered. So with that reactivity cycle, what have you seen to help maybe circumvent or break that reactivity cycle just in a day in the life kind of thing? Well, I think the first thing I always recommend, like build that muscle, right? The overall practice of uh, having a mindfulness practice to build that muscle. So you're not like going into like the parenting equivalent of like the little league world series without ever having gone to a practice, right? You'd never send your kids into that yeah. without having, ever having practice. So you have to, so it's important to practice, right? To have a little bit of muscle, but say we get into that moment and we're starting to have this awareness I'm feeling really irritated right now. We can start to say it like, of course, saying our feelings out loud, naming, saying what we see out loud, that taint that helps to really is like a powerful pattern interrupter mm. in the brain, as far as like the, the neurons and et cetera. So we start to say it out loud. I'm feeling really irritated right now. And then it's like, ding, 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 ding. Okay. Okay. So if we can get to that place, sometimes we find it after the fact, right? We would just want to move that cycle down earlier and earlier as best we can. And, um, we notice it. So then we, we can say, okay, I've got them really irritated right now. I, for me, I often, sometimes we need to do it in that moment. If we have a child in a situation, it's not safe. Sometimes we can take a break, right. And we say, I need to take care mm -hmm. of these, this feeling. So in mindful parenting, I encourage people to have like, I have a whole menu of items and to write down their own little post-it note or five of them of things that, that help them that they can practice. And of course, one of them is deep, slow breaths, which yeah. are cliche because they work. They're literally studying them. Literally like the breath is screens. always the answer to everything. Breath is everything. But they're, yeah. they're studying this with like active duty Marines where they're teaching them to take six deep, slow breaths. And it, it just changes. It's the biology, right? It changes that yeah. fight, flight, or freeze into a rest, more of a rest and really forces that. And it actually activates your spiritual DNA, I believe so that you can make a higher brain choice. 
Well, there you go. That too. Yes. It allows you to access your whole brain for sure. And mm -hmm. so we can kind of use these, some body mind tools. So that's one, a body tool. You can shake it out is another body tool. So for those of you who are on YouTube watching the video, you can like, <laughs> see, I'm shaking my hands. Like you, there's this, uh, this is great book on our bookshelf called why don't zebras get ulcers? <laughs> oh, how funny. <laughs> Which I think is hilarious, but it talks about how they shake. Like, you know, how like a dog shakes, you can shake your shoulders. You can mm. shake your hands, <sighs> side breaths, right? These are all body tools. And then you can also use like tools uh, via the mind, not to create a false dichotomy here between body and mind. But anyway, some of the things that we can use, like we can say, give ourselves a mantra. I am safe. I'm safe, right? And that tells our nervous system that we're safe. This is not an emergency. This is not an emergency. I am safe. You know, you might even put a hand to your heart. It's not an emergency. I'm safe. <sighs> Sigh it out. You can say to yourself, I am helping my child, right? So what I suggest is pick like one or two of those mantras. Pick one or two of those, um, you know, through the body tools, those more physical tools and practice those and envision yourself kind of in a moment see yourself kind of stopping, you know, and, and sometimes it can be as hard as like stopping your pee stream, right? Like <laughs> you, you, you stop. Once it's like, going, oh. it's flowing. There's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and then you say, okay, I need, I need a break. I need a break. <sighs> you do it right there. You model it right there, or you go hide in the bathroom. <laughs> you look at your phone, sit note, and then you do those things. Right. So, mm -hmm. and it really, there's no shame in any of it. It's about, it's about knowing like, yeah, I've got a nervous system that's wired for survival. It's wired yeah. to see a threat. It's wired to, to, to cut off my whole brain. So these practices of, you know, mantras and these little mini mindfulness practices when you're triggered, um, I was thinking as you were talking about how we often send a child to time out, we don't give them these practices. We just tell them to go to their room and deal with it. If they see us doing these things and they see us taking our own time out to do these things in, in sacred, private ritual, whatever we're doing, don't you, have you found that that's, I mean, I don't know yeah, if, what your time out policy is. That's what they is, need but, to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no time out is a, it, it was much better than spanking, which is why it was developed because it was much better than spanking. You know, we don't want to be using violence with our kids, but yeah. a timeout doesn't teach our kids anything. It teaches them to resent us. You know, when we put our kids in timeout, then we have to be the enforcer. Then they, they don't think, you know, then they just, it creates a disconnection. It makes them resent us, makes them less likely to do what we ask in the future. It becomes harder and harder. We have to up the ante as time goes on yeah. when we follow that path. But when we can say, um, there's some crazy behavior going on. What does my child need to learn mm -hmm. instead? Right. That's, that's when we're really teaching. And that's really the meaning of discipline is like the same root as the word disciple to teach, right. To follow. Mm -hmm. And we can think of it in that way. Like we need to, to discipline our kids. We need to teach them how, you know, what do they need to learn in that moment? How do they need to express their anger or, or take right. care of their feelings? Right. And how can we Absolutely. model that? Yes. So thinking about parenting more in partnership oftentimes versus this power over dynamic um well raise good humans as your book says it's 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 about being relational it's about getting on their level where can people find your book hunter how can they find what, what you're doing and where you're at well the book is anywhere books are sold there's an audiobook version it's in bulgarian as well <laughs> and brazilian oh, really? portuguese if you want it there nice. <laughs> just sort of random um <laughs> Uh, you can hear me on the mindful mama podcast and, uh, you can find everything at mindful mama mentor.com. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us today. This has been awesome. Yay. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for sharing your, your platform and your time. It's been a joy. This discussion with Hunter is just such a good reminder for me to come back to the heart of parenting, which is really just about being present with the souls you've been given, <laughs> the souls God and the universe sent you to raise. And uh, in many ways, they are raising us. They're teaching us spiritual practice and mindfulness uh, in ways we couldn't otherwise learn. 
So you can find Hunter on her website, mindfulmamamentor.com. Yeah, and I love what she said about love and attention. They're kind of intertwined. So love is attention, she says. And if we pay more attention to it, we end up loving it. Giving our children attention (laughs) is what they're actually really, really craving. And in turn, we receive that attention for ourselves that our souls so much want to bring us back to the present. So have a glorious week and we will talk to you next week on Women Seeking Wholeness.